So, following this somewhat tangled introduction, we will embark upon the significantly more tangled and more sensitive, yet hopeful and indeed necessary work of reflecting upon where we stand on the occasion of the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Now, even on a gracious occasion such as this, I don't think it makes any sense to pretend that there are no more important divisions remaining among us. And I'm not going to hide that. As I worked on this sermon, and I will tell you, I have really been sweating this out. This is not an ordinary assignment. As I worked on this sermon, my text, which was just read to you, the passage about the vine and the branches, I found plenty of evidence in my research that we have some really serious disagreements that remain unresolved. One of the most basic differences between Catholics and Protestants can be quickly identified in the history of interpretation of this passage. Raymond Brown, possibly the, probably in fact, the most illustrious of all Catholic New Testament scholars in the past century, and I'm very proud to say my teacher, Raymond Brown states in his commentary on the, Epistle, the Gospel of John that the passage on the vine and the branches is only secondarily about the Eucharist, focusing rather on Jesus' word. Edwin Hoskins, another important interpreter of the Gospel of John, argues that the passage is primarily and indeed entirely about the Eucharist, and he was not a Catholic, but Church of England. Rudolf Bultmann, yet another premier interpreter, insists that the imagery of the vine is not about the Eucharist at all, since neither wine nor bread is mentioned. He and Raymond Brown both emphasize Jesus' saying in the text you just heard, that his disciples have been made clean by his word. So you see there are some significant issues that remain unsettled right here in our gospel passage for this evening. And those issues are painfully obvious in this service because we cannot receive communion together. But I think we can say this, although the split in the churches about, for instance, the relative importance of the word and the sacrament, although it's a serious division, it's not fatal. There's a divine unity in the church that we cannot destroy because it is the body of Christ, whether we act like it or not. So in that faith, let's look more closely once again at the gospel read. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. Every branch of mine that bears no fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already made clean by the word which I have spoken to you. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who abides in me and I in that one. That one will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. On the last evening of his life, Jesus of Nazareth arranged a dinner in an upper room 
for his last night with his 12 disciples. Now let's try to get this setting firmly fixed in our minds. The master, so beloved yet so perplexing, is preparing the men who have followed him for three years to understand that he is leaving them, leaving them by themselves. In a few hours, they will see him arrested, abandoned, stripped, scourged, mocked, humiliated, and nailed to a cross by the side of the road in the most degrading and dehumanizing way possible. Humanly speaking, this extreme event would put an end to any movement. But Jesus, in these last discourses, as they're called, the farewell discourses, Jesus is preparing his disciple for the f disciples for the future of his presence in the world. The words recorded by John the Evangelist in these chapters, 14 through 16, are the final words of the Master to the group of men that he has gathered around himself and taught for three years. Now this setting, for the words that you have just heard, this setting is therefore of special significance. It's so important to understand the context of biblical passages. We need to remind ourselves of the drama of this whole biblical scene. As John, the evangelist, presents it. First, Jesus takes off his clothes, except for a loincloth, which is what a slave wears. Then, like a slave, he washes the disciples' feet. Over many, many years, many decades of listening to Holy Thursday sermons, I've noticed that often the emphasis is placed in the wrong direction. What John wants us to see is not just what we're supposed to do for each other, and not simply on the humility of Jesus either. What's really at stake here is the identity of Jesus. There's a tight link, canonically speaking, between the foot washing scene and the saying of St. Paul in Philippians, that Christ Jesus was in the form of God, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. So then, immediately after, Jesus sits down and addresses the disciples with this image of the vine and the branches, but he is clearly speaking to them of who it is that has just washed their feet. Not just what he does, but who he is. So we need to focus first of all, focus first of all, on the person who is saying, I am the true vine. This is the next to last of the I am sayings in the Gospel of John. The I am sayings, ego I me, in Greek. These sayings taken together add up to a uniquely staggering claim. Best summed up in the scene that will take place just two or three hours later on the Mount of Olives when Jesus is taken into custody by a crew of religious officials and men with torches, torches at night. That has a resonance nowadays, doesn't it? Men with torches at night. 
the men declare that they seek Jesus of Nazareth. Now, most of the translations into English say that the Lord responds, I am he. But that's not what the Greek says. In the original Greek of the, of the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am. And the men fell to the ground. Now, this is the climax of the I am sayings. And it really can't be construed as anything other than a deliberate approach, appropriation by Jesus of the name given by God to Moses from the burning bush. Therefore, at the moment when his passion begins, Jesus unequivocally identifies himself as nothing less, nothing less than the living presence of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the creator of the universe, the Lord that is and that was and who is to come. Now this matter of the identity of Jesus the man who says in such a commanding way that he alone is the true vine that gives life and fruit to the branches. This matter of the identity of Jesus is of unique, irreducible, and primary significance for the Christian church. And yet, And yet it is that very identity that has been called into question, not only just from skeptics in academic circles, but from within the church itself. Christology, the study of the identity of Jesus Christ, Christology has been seriously and systematically undermined for decades without a strong response from the churches until quite recently. And the results have been devastating. Luke Timothy Johnson has written that a Christological collapse has occurred as a result of the church's capitulation to pressures from academic circles and from generically religious trends in the culture. Cardinal Avery Dulles, in his dying message, warned against this seductive line of thinking within the church that has led Christian people to lose faith in Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. Father Robert M. Belly has written that we cannot speak of evangelization and church growth unless we reaffirm the source of our life in the life of God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Christian Wyman, the poet who has suffered from a particularly terrible form of cancer, comes very close to the inner meaning of the vine imagery when he writes, Christ's life is not simply a model for how to live, but the living truth of my own existence. What a wonderful phrase, living truth. The evangelist John could have written that. Jesus Christ is the living truth of the existence of the church. Truth is a major theme in the fourth gospel. Jesus says, I am the true vine. A few interpreters have actually speculated that the disciples might have seen vines or commented on vines earlier that day or earlier that week. Vineyards were common sights in their environment. Not only so, but the vineyard was a premier symbol for the people of God. 
in the Old Testament. So when Jesus says, I am the true vine, I am the true vine, he is emphasizing his singularity as the one and only source of the community that comes into being around him. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I spend a lot of my time in the Massachusetts Berkshire Hills. We are plagued by wild grapevines, which can grow large enough to cover a mature oak tree. One day I noticed a vine that was strangling a young birch tree on our road, so much so that the tree was beginning to droop down from the weight of the vine in a very alarming fashion. I went over and started trying to pull the vine out of the tree. Very quickly it became obvious that this was a fool's errand. So I went back to the house and I got our large lopping tool and I took it back to the tree. I found the place where the vine was rooted in the ground and I cut through the trunk right where it was growing. Within two days, the lush green vine began to wither and die. Now, this recollection came back to me when I was considering Jesus' words this past week. It is the Lord himself who is the life of the church. And when we no longer seek our life from him and from him alone, the church will begin to dry up. We don't live from his teachings at second hand. We live from himself. Crucified, risen, ascended, reigning, and coming again. Now it's a fact that many prominent Lutherans and Episcopalians have become Catholics. You know who many of them are. I think there is, I may be wrong about this, but I think there's one very particular overriding reason for this. At least among those whom I know. It's the magisterial, the teaching office of the Church of Rome. Some of us can only take so much more chipping away at the very life of the church, the unique identity of the one who says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Father Mbele, who calls himself a, proudly a man of Vatican II, calls on four different popes in his book, recent book, calls on four different popes to illustrate the Christological theme. Benedict XVI, he writes, underscores the fidelity of Paul VI and John Paul II to the Council's confession of the Christ structure and heart of faith a deep and complete convergence upon Jesus Christ as the center of the cosmos and of history. Jesus Christ is not only the object of the faith, but as Hebrews says, he is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Pope Francis also, in belly writes, has urged the church Put on Christ. Protestantism in our time does not seem to have very many effective guards at the gateway of the gospel. So there have been some significant defections from those who want to commit themselves to a church that still stands firmly 
for the uniqueness of Christ our Redeemer. Now you may have noticed that I'm not mentioning any of the presenting symptoms of the ills of the Church of Rome or in the zillion and one varieties of Protestantism either. Our focus tonight is on the Lord of the Church, the very lifeblood of its existence. There are many things that continue to divide us. Episcopalians are set against other Episcopalians right here in Savannah. Lutherans are set against Lutherans. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And although our divisions and our errors are grievous to him, he remains the true vine who gives life to the branches so that we will bear much fruit. For without him, we can do nothing. Now there's a fashion today in the church, certainly in my church, for saying that we live into various things. We live into our baptism. We live into our calling. We live into our mission. Now, I think that's a very 21st century humanist way, do-it-yourself way of speaking. We don't live into the vine. We don't live into Jesus Christ, who is the life of the church and of every Christian. The vine lives into us. The life of Jesus pours into us, not the other way around. Jesus Christ, of one substance with the Father. Now, I have quoted quite a few Catholics tonight in this sermon. It's my impression that Protestants read Catholic scholars a lot more than Catholics read Protestants. So I may be wrong about that, but I don't think so. I'm going to bring to this climax, or rather, I'm going to bring my sermon to a climax now by referring to an, a couple of Protestants. Rudolf Bultmann was wrong about many things. That is generally agreed today, I think. But he was right about the main thing. Here is Rudolf Bultmann writing about the Gospel of John. Faith is the unconditional decision to base oneself on the act of God at the cost of giving up on one's own ability. It is not a primarily a continued being for, but a being from. Not the holding of a position, but allowing oneself to be held. His word, the word of Jesus, makes alive and establishes anew one's whole existence. And here, dear Lutherans, is that towering Protestant doctor of the church, Karl Barth, quoting Luther, speaking of the subject of the church's union with Christ the vine. Let us listen to this, all of us, with open hearts. Luther maintained that in the incomparable grace of faith, the soul and Christ are coupled together in a marriage far surpassing the fleeting image of what passes for such among human beings. Since in the grace of faith, the soul may possess and glory in everything that belongs to Christ because Christ has made his own everything that belongs to us, sin, death, and condemnation. Now, do you hear that? This is the great exchange. Christ, the true vine, has given us everything that he has. 
He has emptied himself of his divinity in order to give us his glory. And in his passion, he has taken everything that belonged to us since the fall of Adam. Sin, death, condemnation. He has taken all of that to himself on the cross into hell and has borne it away. There cannot be any union of the church this evening in the supper of the Lord. Not yet. God willing, the union that we may, may sense moving among us tonight is the union of the church in the word. You are made clean by the word I have spoken to you, said the Lord. For tonight, for right now, that is enough. The Lord has spoken the word, and he is the word. The word was in the beginning with God, and the word was God. He is the vine. You are his branches. In spite of our sad divisions, here we are for this one moment in time and eternity, in this space. Made clean by the word he has spoken and the word, the Lagos, that he is. In closing, let us hear the words of Jesus himself from chapter 16 as he prays for us, prays for you, prays for me. For the branches of his vine, here, now, as the living voice of the living Christ. And Jesus said, Father, the glory which you have given me I have given unto them that they may be one even as you and I are one. I in them and you in me. That they may be perfected into one. That the world may know that you have sent me and that you love them even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. For I made your name known unto them and will make it known that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. Amen.